Welcome. Good afternoon. We're so glad to see so many of you here today. This is an exciting event, um, and we are thrilled to have a speaker who is so distinguished come to share her ideas and inspiration with us. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Patrice Harris, MD, who became the president of the American Medical Association in June of 2019. She is the first African-American uh, woman to hold this position and has a very, very diverse uh, experience as a private practicing physician, a public health administrator, a patient advocate, and medical society lobbyist. If you watch the Charleston Gazette recently, every now and then there's an article that she's written as she advocates for some of the best um, uh, medical uh, advances that, that uh, can help the state, and I'm thrilled that she's here to share some of her ideas. She currently spearheads the AMA's efforts to end the opioid epidemic, and she's been chair of the AMA Opioid um, Task Force since its inception in 2014. She grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia, and dreamt of entering medicine at a time when few women of color were encouraged to become physicians. She spent her formative years at West Virginia University earning a BA in psychology, an MA in counseling psychology, and ultimately a medical degree in 1992. It was during this time that her passion for helping children emerged, and she completed her psychiatry residency and fellowships in child and adolescent psychology, psychiatry and forensic psychiatry at Emory University School of Medicine. I want to thank Nancy Ellison, director of our Office of Multi Multicultural Affairs, for hosting Dr. Harris's visit to Concord. And now I ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Harris to Concord University. We're very excited to hear what you have to share with us and are looking forward to your inspiration. How's everyone doing today? Great, great. I know we have an audience here and an audience that's watching via live stream. So again, I thank everyone uh, for participating today. As you heard, I am uh, Dr. Patrice Harris, and I'm so honored uh, to be back in my home town of Bluefield and Mercer County and Concord. Our, area in southern West Virginia is very special to me, um, always has been, and it always gives me great pleasure to come back, particularly during this time of year. It's such a beautiful place. So thank you for giving me the opportunity, and thank you, Madam President, from one president uh, to another. Congratulations uh, on uh, your leadership here at Concord. And so speaking of leadership, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, my journey uh, today and my journey through the leadership of the American Medical Association and also talk with you about how the AMA is leading on issues, some of the greatest challenges in healthcare that are affecting our country today. But at the end of the day, no matter what career path you pursue, it is important to lead with authenticity. And I have had the wonderful opportunity uh, to throughout actually my career in medicine and throughout my career in order, organized medicine to lead from my sense of pur purpose re regarding efforts and interests that were very important to me, efforts and interests that I thought are very important as we advance healthcare across this country. And so I'll start again a little bit with my journey and then talk about what we're doing at the AMA. And I will time myself because I wanna make sure uh, we have time for question and answers because I really uh, love the uh, interaction part of any of my presentations. So you heard a little bit about me, again, born and raised not too far from here in Bluefield, West Virginia. And in fact, uh, one of the many reasons that I came uh, to visit this time was that I was inducted into the Bluefield High School Hall of Fame today. That was so much fun earlier this morning. Thank you. By the way, 
Can you all hear me okay? Can, you, can everyone hear me okay? Um, but again, born and raised in Bluefield, West Virginia, uh, you heard that I went to WVU for undergrad and medical school and then went to Emory University in Atlanta uh, for my residency training. I am a practicing psychiatrist, I'm child and adolescent psychiatrist, but I've worked um, with those who have substance use disorder, and I also work with those who have some interaction with the criminal justice system, and that um, is what I do with my training in forensic psychiatry. Um, I have had a variety of experiences career experiences. So something that I recommend is do different things. I've had the traditional private practice where patients come to my office and see me. I've consulted with agencies that are working with children in the foster care system and the juvenile justice system in Atlanta. For a couple of years, I was actually a lobbyist at the Georgia General Assembly. Now, how in the world uh, did that happen? I went to the Capitol one day, and I heard someone talking to his or her legislator, and yes, it is a free country and we have free speech, but they were making a claim that was really not based in evidence. And I overheard that, and that was my aha moment. And that really led to my interest in what we call organized medicine, getting involved in medical associations, because I learned then at that moment that it was important for physicians to be involved, to be leaders. Absolutely, as physicians, we need to take care of our patients and be involved in that way. But we also need to lead and lead with authenticity in other venues because there are folks who are making decisions at state legislatures and in Congress that affect our ability to care for our patients. And so that was my aha moment. And so for several years, I was a lobbyist at the Georgia General Assembly. I also led our public health department. And so that was an interesting departure as a psychiatrist leading a public health department. But of course, I have always, number one, been interested in public psychiatry, but number two, appreciated the need to impact the larger community. In fact, some of you in the room look as old as I am, and I'm young, I'm gonna say that, but my inspiration for going to medical school was Marcus Welby. So some of you in the room know Marcus Welby. For those who don't, Marcus Welby was a TV doctor. So you can consider it for the younger folks in the room, and you can Google it a little later, but my Gray's Anatomy. But what I liked about Dr. Welby was he not only, and this was TV, so keep that in mind if you ever look at any of the old episodes, but Dr. Welby not only cared about his patients inside the exam room, he cared about his patients outside the exam room. And I saw that physicians were well respected in the community and they had a platform. Now, as I told the students earlier, never did I ever dream I would have this platform as president of the American Medical Association. Uh, but certainly, again, another dream that came true, the opportunity to impact the health of everyone in this country, not only on an individual level, but on a community level and across this country. As you heard, I chair the AMA's Opioid Task Force since its inception, I have to say, certainly that's professional to me, but also that's personal to me. Because I was aware, living in Atlanta since 1992, of the impact that this opioid epidemic has had on our wonderful, beautiful state. And so as I led and chaired the AMA's collaborative efforts on the opioid um, epidemic, I always had a keen view and vision of how this was impacting uh, the state of West Virginia. And so just this past uh, June, I was inaugurated as the 174th president of the AMA, but also the first African-American woman to be the president of the AMA, and such a privilege and a responsibility. And we also made more history uh, this past June, because you see before you on this slide the three women presidents, as we call them, at the AMA. For the first time in AMA history, we have the president-elect, Dr. Sue Bailey, you have me, and you have the immediate past president, Dr. Barbara McEnany. So for the first time in the history of our organization, we have three women presidents. So certainly a history-making all around at the AMA. 
Now I'll tell you a little bit just briefly about the AMA because most folks think of um, medical organizations and particularly looking mainly through their specialty lens. So where we continue to get our education, our continuing medical education, the AMA is a little bit different. The AMA is the policy making arm. The AMA House of Delegates is the policy making body. And so twice a year, representatives from every state and every specialty and some specialty sections, the medical student section, the senior physician section, the women's physician section, the international medical graduate section, we come together twice a year to debate policy. So think of it as sort of the Congress of Medicine. All of these representatives in a room debating, sometimes passionately, but always with the science in mind about what policy will then become the policy of the American Medical Association. And as you see on this slide, the AMA has been a long a time advocate of public health and health in this country, from putting seat belts in cars uh, to working to end smoking working hard on the issues around tobacco, uh, to looking at anti-discriminatory practices regarding those who have HIV and AIDS. So the AMA has been a long-term advocate and supporter for many issues surrounding the health in this country, and we will continue to do so. And every year at our House of Delegates, as you can see, that's the front of the room and very democratic. Those two people that you see at the front of the room are our speaker and vice speaker. So when I tell you we're very democratic and, and we function sort of like Congress, I, can, I hope this picture um, uh, shows you that. One of the issues that the AMA um, has as its core is making sure that everyone, we're not making sure, but advocating, and we hope to make sure that everyone has access to affordable, uh, meaningful health coverage. And as many of you may know, um, that is one of the many reasons we supported the Affordable Care Act. Um, we know that people without health insurance live sicker and die younger. And so advocating that everyone has access to affordable, meaningful health coverage, and that of course includes coverage uh, for mental illnesses and substance use disorders, is a core uh, vision and principle of the American Medical Association. So I think I don't need to tell you in this room, there are many challenges today, and some of the issues uh, are on this screen. Despite the progress that was made with the Affordable Care Act, we still have millions in this country who lack access uh, to affordable health coverage. Uh, we know that there's a high cost of care, even for those who have insurance. Uh, we know, and we're working on this at the AMA, uh, that we need to continue to be on our journey to ensure workforce diversity. Uh, you've heard about the opioid epidemic. Uh, what's in the news today? The vaping epidemic. So there are myriad challenges, again, that we all face as a community. And I want you to know that the AMA and the physicians want to be your partner. It's going to take all of us to address some of the many challenges uh, that affect us today. But as I said in my inaugural address, and I know this goes for many of you in this room, when I was talking to an audience of physicians, physicians don't run away from problems, we run towards them. And so I know that you in this room think the same way, and that's the attitude we must have if we uh, want to address, again, these issues on the screen and the many issues impacting our country and that impact the health of everyone in this country today. So the AMA uh, wants to be your powerful ally. Now this slide says physicians, but we want to be everyone's powerful ally as we address many of these challenges. And so the AMA conceives our work in three large buckets. The first is addressing and attacking some of the dysfunction, the administrative and regulatory burden in healthcare today. The second is around issues of chronic disease. We know that there's a human toll and a financial toll. And so we want to work with you, with all of the stakeholders to address chronic disease. 
And the third issue is around innovation. And I'm very excited about innovation as we think uh, about this state and opportunities for this state. The Amy looked and said, you know, we need to make sure we prepare the next generation of physicians for 21st century health care. <laughs> And we really haven't changed the way we educate physicians in a while. So we wanted to spur innovation in how we educate, again, physicians in this country. And we awarded some grants. I'll talk a little bit about this later. The other issue is just innovation in general. I know you see this. You see the health apps. I'm sure many of you in this room have a wearable. You have a Fitbit or one of the, the wearables that may be tracking your respirations and your, your heart rate. And we know there is just a revolution in digital technology and the AMA wants to make sure uh, that physicians are at the forefront of that technology so that the technology adds to our ability to take care of patients and doesn't detract from our ability to take care of patients. I, I'm certain and this is an unfortunate circumstance that, uh, but I've heard complaints um, that uh, physicians are not looking at, at patients uh, when they come into the office. And we uh, want to take good care of our patients. We want to spend more time with our patients, uh, but we know there's that burden of electronic health records. So we are working on innovation. You know, what if? And whatever the next generation of digital health and technology and innovation is, the AMA wants to be there at the beginning of the conversation and not at the end of the conversation. Another core principle for the AMA is our commitment to health equity. And that is across uh, health care. Now, first of all, this is foundational for us. If you read the AMA's Code of Ethics, and I know that that's on the top of all of your reading lists, uh, but if you read the AMA Code of Ethics, you will see uh, that principles around non-discrimination um, is, again, a foundational principle. And so we know uh, that we want to make sure uh, that everyone has access uh, to healthcare and that healthcare is meeting the needs of the diverse population that we have in this country. So we are embarking on what I call our health equity 2.0 work. Of course, we have the policy. Of course, we're advocating for that policy, but we just hired at the AMA our first chief health equity officer. And what we want to do is embed the concept and the work of health equity across our organization. You know, um, we do not want, and it is, we are not going to allow um, diversity and inclusion and health equity to be a buzzword, right? To be um, sort of the word of the day or the trendy word. We, again, commit to embedding the concept of health equity into all of our work. Because again, as I said, we know that people without insurance live sicker and die younger. We know that sometimes people from communities of color have higher rates of illness and death. In fact, I had the wonderful opportunity to speak before Congress about a month ago, and I was speaking about maternal mortality and morbidity. Now, I've heard a lot of presentations, and West Virginia is also struggling with this issue around maternal mortality and morbidity. And so it affects everyone, but certainly we know that if you are a black woman in this country, on average, your rate or risk of dying around childbirth is three to four times higher. If you are Native American or Alaska Native, it's two to three times higher. Why is this? We must ask this question. And that's what I talked to the students earlier today and encourage them to ask questions. When you see a statistic uh, that more people are dying, uh, from one disease than another. Uh, if you live in a certain zip code, you have a longer life expectancy. We have to ask the hard questions about that data, and then once we get the answers, we have to look for solutions and implement those solutions. So again, the AMA is very committed uh, to this work of health equity for everyone in our nation. 
Now, one of the things we also have to talk about are the different determinants of health. Absolutely, you need to have access to a physician. I was talking earlier about the importance of hospitals in rural areas. And so your access to a physician and hospital is critical. But those are not the only determinants of health. As you can see on this slide, there are other determinants of health. Now there are our genetics, and, and I have to say, 10 years ago, I would have said, there's nothing we can do about our genetics, but with all the technology and the innovation, uh, there will be gene editing. Of course, we're early in that, but again, uh, most of the time we um, are who we are and we have the genes that we have. But what else? What about other factors? when I talked about where you live, your zip code. It's your educational attainment. It's whether or not you are employed. It's whether or not you have transportation. It's whether or not you have housing. All of those impact our health. What about bias and discrimination and racism? Those also impact our health all issues that, again, we all have a collective responsibility to address in our community. Now, you see on this slide individual behaviors. And there is no question that if you smoke, you have higher risk of disease. If you don't get any physical activity, you have higher risk of disease. If you don't eat a healthy, balanced diet, you have a higher risk of disease. All of those are very important. But when I talk about individual behaviors and choices, I always wanna make sure I leave you with this. The choices we all make are based on the choices we have. And so if I tell my patients to eat a well-balanced diet and eat more fruits and vegetables, what if they live in a food desert? How many of you know what a food desert is? Food desert is a term to describe an area of a city where there are no grocery stores, perhaps, or where there are no farmer's markets, or where there's really no opportunity, and maybe you'll go uh, to a corner store and the fruits and vegetables are 10 days old and not very appetizing. So again, the choices we make are based on the choices we have, and so that's our collective responsibility to make sure that everyone has equitable opportunities to make healthy choices. Uh, we don't want to end up blaming people uh, when they really don't have opportunities. They don't have transportation. Again, they can't, their neighborhoods aren't safe. And so as a physician, I may say, you know, you don't have to join a fancy gym or pay for a gym membership. Just walk around your neighborhood at the end of the day. But if your neighborhood is unsafe, if there are no well-lit sidewalks. Actually, if there are no sidewalks at all, it is more difficult to make those choices. So as we talk about individual behaviors and choices, I think we should all keep that in mind, those points in mind. You heard me say earlier uh, that the AMA is committed and has as a core value um, access to affordable, meaningful coverage. Again, the Affordable Care Act was not a perfect piece of legislation, but we did make progress, and the AMA is committed to making sure we continue on that progress. We believe that the best path forward is to build upon the progress we've made, the Affordable Care Act. Millions of people were able to have access to health insurance, and as a psychiatrist, I can tell you that millions of people are now able to get um, help for their substance use disorder or their mental illness that they didn't have before. And so we wanna build upon that, and we are fighting in the court, as you can see in this case, the Texas v. Azar case, we are fighting against any attempts to roll back the progress that we've made uh, with the Affordable Care Act. The other issue, and I'm sure this comes as no surprise as a psychiatrist, uh, but I hope everyone thinks that it is very important to integrate mental health care into our overall health care. For so many years, mental health care has been sort of off to the side. Sometimes we didn't even talk about it. Folks weren't even comfortable talking about mental health care. We still have those challenges, no doubt. One of the things that I uh, want to do, again, during that platform that I talked about at the beginning, uh, was to elevate the importance of integrating mental health care into overall primary care. 
Another issue that I want to elevate this year is the importance of looking at childhood trauma and the study around adverse childhood experiences. And I can go into this more if you'd like, if you have any questions, but there was a study uh, done by the Kaiser Family Foundation years ago uh, that said if you experience several of the um, uh, adverse childhood experiences that they looked for, you were more likely to have negative health impacts. And I think the first uh, thing people think of is, well, maybe you'll have more depression or more anxiety. But the data showed even more cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And so I really want to elevate the importance of appreciating the impact of childhood trauma and making sure we develop systems around addressing uh, these issues. AMA has lots of policy and supporting issues around a healthy childhood, and I will tell you, and I don't know if there are any of you in the room who want to go into early childhood education, three to six, zero to six, that's critical time for brain development. And so when the brain is developing at such rapid speed, that's a critical opportunity for us uh, to develop programs, again, to give everyone uh, those opportunities to live full, healthy, productive lives. Now you heard me talk about public health crises that we address, and I know it's in the news uh, around vaping. So first of all, I want to say let's not forget that nicotine has negative health outcomes. That is a known in this. In this vaping, you know that health officials are still trying to figure out what exactly has led uh, to the deaths, unfortunately, and the respiratory, the lung problems. But here's one thing we know. We know about the long-term negative effects of nicotine. And we particularly know about the effects of nicotine on the developing brain. And by the way, those of you in this room who are less than 25, the brain still develops up to 25 years of age. I guess for me and some of the other folks in the room, it's, it's all hope is lost. Uh, but uh, for, so I want those of you, the young folks in the room, call, your brain is still developing. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Listen, I know vaping looks cool. Uh, but it's so much we, again, know and don't know about the negative uh, long-term effects of health. And by the way, there is no evidence that um, e-cigarette use um, is uh, useful for uh, smoking cessation, but we do have evidence on certain uh, products that have already been approved by the FDA uh, to help people uh, stop smoking. So we don't want folks to smoke. Um, a long-term health effects of smoking, uh, and there are, again, FDA-approved products, but this is a huge issue, and that's why we're very concerned and have asked to ban flavored um, e-cigarettes, um, because we really worry uh, about what we know about the negative effects of vaping. We know about chronic disease, and again, another issue uh, that I'm sure you all know well here in West Virginia with, with high blood pressure and diabetes. And it's a human toll, uh, but it's also a financial toll. And so the AMA uh, developed a partnership with the American Diabetes Association, and we thought, what if, let's go one step before diabetes, right? One in three folks in this country have prediabetes. That's the step you get before you develop type uh, 2 diabetes. So we developed this website. I encourage any of you who are worried or concerned, and that should be all of us, because you want to know what your risk factors are, uh, to go to the website, doihaveprediabetes.org, and answer those questions, and then take those questions in to your uh, physician and talk about how you can uh, change your risk factors for uh, developing um, prediabetes. And we don't want you to develop uh, prediabetes. So we work with the Ad Council, and we, didn't, we don't have the cables, but you can go, you can see this commercial. So we work with the Ad Council because we wanted to um, reach folks, and we didn't want to be, you know, sometimes doctors were stern or serious, and we're probably nagging you about your health. Um, but we developed a, a set of commercials and advertisements with the Ad Council. So you can go to the website and see this commercial. I won't be able to show it to you uh, today. But we use a little bit of humor in trying to get the word out about the importance of knowing um, if you have prediabetes and therefore at risk for developing uh, type 2 by diabetes. One in three oh. adults has pre Only I can hear that. Our other issue is around heart disease. So here's what we know around hypertension. 
There are millions of folks walking around this country with high blood pressure, high blood pressure, the pressure as my grandmother used to call it, and don't know it. We also know there are millions of folks walking around this country who've been diagnosed with high blood pressure and they're not treated to target. And you know the risk of untreated high blood pressure, stroke, loss of vision and eyesight, loss of limbs. And so we want to make sure, and that's with diabetes, and so we want to make sure um, that we get everyone to know, first of all, if they have high blood pressure, we want it measured accurately. And then if you have high blood pressure, we want to get it treated to target. So on this project, we are working with the American Heart Association to highlight um, heart disease, again, and diabetes. So another website to go to, targetbp.org, if you want further information. Overdoses by opioid are now the leading cause of death for folks under 50. And this opioid epidemic, I don't have to tell you, has impacted actually everyone across this country, but again, particularly has hit um, West Virginia hard. We know the opioid epidemic has evolved. It's no longer, the deaths are no longer mainly due to prescription drugs. The deaths now are due to illicitly and let me and hear me when I say this, illicitly manufactured fentanyl. So some of you may be saying, what is fentanyl? So, so here's the thing, all of these are in the class of opioids, prescriptions, fentanyl, heroin. Um, fentanyl is FDA approved drug used to treat severe pain. But now we have folks who are manufacturing fentanyl, which is much more potent uh, than heroin and maybe some of the pain pills that you may be familiar with, oxycodone and so forth and so on. And there's also another drug that's used for large animals, elephants and horses. But unfortunately, those two products, those two drugs are getting into the supply. Folks are even making them look like pills. So folks may think they're taking a, a pain pill. This is, this is an illic illicitly manufactured pill and then they're dying. And that's because these pills uh, may contain, and you might not know, either fentanyl or carfentanyl. And so we know now uh, that this epidemic has evolved and it's critical for all of us who are working on this epidemic uh, to catch up uh, with the current, um, what's going on currently with the epidemic and develop solutions. And so the AMA task force that you heard I chair and another website for you to go get more information is at the bottom of this screen. But we came out with these six original recommendations in 2015. We wanted to demonstrate physician leadership on this issue, leading with authenticity. No question, many reasons why we're here today and physicians know that we had a role to play. And so we wanted to lead with authenticity on this issue. Here were the six recommendations. You see one up there is stigma. These were for physicians. But stigma is something all of us can work on. We can all make sure people have accurate information. I know uh, all of us have social media and we are bombarded, bombarded with a lot of misinformation on social media, for instance, on vaccines. And so we have to make sure that we use appropriate language. I don't use the term, we should not use the term addicts. It's somebody that has a, a person that has a substance use disorder. Whenever you hear the term drug addicted babies, I want you to raise your hand and say, that's not an appropriate term to use. Babies cannot be addicted. Babies can be born um, with what we call neonatal abstinence syndrome. They can have a dependence because their moms use, but babies are not addicted. So it's the language, I think, and so I want everyone to be very careful with the language that we use um, when we are talking about uh, substance use disorders and actually mental illnesses in general. I don't know how many times I heard I'm a psychiatrist, somebody would say, I don't need to see a psychiatrist, I'm not crazy. Well, what we have to know is there are lots, there's lots of loaded um, uh, valence in that term of crazy. Um, but you know what? All of us, at some point of, or another, could benefit from health. So not sure what crazy means. Uh, I know in the lay language or there are different severities of mental disorders, uh, but we have to be careful with the words we use so that we don't um, continue the stigma. 
Uh, many of you know about naloxone. I was talking with the students about the importance of Good Samaritan laws, and I know every state has a Good Samaritan law. You know, several years ago, let's say you were uh, doing a heroin. It is illegal. And you were doing it with someone, and they had overdose. Uh, many times people were afraid, luckily we've changed, to call for 911 because they were afraid they may get arrested as well. And that's why um, every state has a Good Samaritan law on the books. It said if you call 911, uh, you won't be arrested, but you can certainly save a life. And if any of you in this room, because a lot of people do need these medications, make sure they are stored appropriately and locked so that people, um, no one else but you, uh, can use these medications. We've made progress, prescriptions are down, we're increasing our education, but we by no means can declare victory, and we still have a ways to go. I've already talked about the stigma um, and the, the importance of all of us addressing stigma. But that's why, again, the AMA at this point is laser focused on treatment. This slide should worry us all. Across this country, only two in 10 people who need access to evidence-based substance use disorder have access to it, two in 10. So we need to make sure that we work hard uh, to ensure that everyone has access to treatment because this should be 10 out of 10 folks who realize they have an opiate use disorder have access to evidence-based treatment for that opioid use disorder. And so here are our new recommendations. We want to eliminate prior authorization. If you come to me and say, Doc, I have a substance, you might not come and say I have a substance use disorder, but if you come and you say I need help, can you help me, and I determine that you have an opioid use disorder, I shouldn't have to fill out a bunch of paperwork and wait days, hours, or weeks before you get approved for treatment. And so we are encouraging the elimination of any prior authorization. Uh, we are encouraging state and local officials to look and make sure their uh, payers, the commercial, those who give, provide insurance, uh, provide, uh, I'm, abide by the federal parity laws. I can answer any question about that. But that means uh, that you can get care for your substance use disorder just as easily as you can get care if you have a heart attack. That's what we want to make sure is happening. Uh, we want to make sure uh, that um, states make sure that there's providers in the state uh, that provides evidence-based treatment. It's not enough for you to say, I think I'm providing evidence-based treatment. You should follow the science. And if you hold yourself out to be a provider of substance use uh, disorder treatment, you should really be providing treatment that's evidence-based and the science backs it up. Just two weeks ago, we um, rolled out our national opioid roadmap, and it had many of the recommendations that I've already talked about. Uh, we know the four states you've seen on the slide have done the, our pilot work in this area, and so we are encouraging all states to get a hold of our roadmap and move forward on that. You heard me talk a little about the future of medicine. Medicine is becoming more diverse, younger. We need to make sure we continue activities in that manner, as I said in my inaugural address, we want to make sure that the faces of our physicians match the faces of our patients. You see on this slide Dr. Jerome Adams, who is the current Surgeon General, and he's very invested and involved in one of our programs. We call that Doctors Back to School. Uh, you know, um, people ask me what's the most uh, fun part of my work. And I say that's being tangible evidence, and I know I met some of the young women, some of the African-American young women here um, who say they are inspired by me. I'm still getting a little used to that, uh, but I know that it's important for uh, young folks to see um, what they can be. And that's why we're very um, involved in that at the AMA. I've already talked about our work in innovation and how we train medical students and residents. Uh, we, again, want to prepare the next generation of physicians to meet the challenges, not only today's challenges, but challenges that we can anticipate um, tomorrow. So at the AMA, we are leading. Um, we are leading on the healthcare front. Um, I happen to be in leadership, but I'm one of many in leadership at the AMA who wants to lead by example, lead with our policy, 
and lead with authenticity. So I thank you very much for your time and attention this afternoon, and I think I have a few minutes for questions. And if there's a question on any slide, I'm happy to go back to a slide if you want to see it or you, you uh, had a question about any particular area. And there's going to be, since this is being live streamed, please wait for the mic uh, before you ask your question. And tell me a little bit who you, you don't have to say your first name, last name, or your first name, and if you're a student or. You know. yes, so my name is Jacob. I'm a student here at Concord. I'm a senior uh, in political science and history. And one of the things that I um, do voluntarily is I do surveys with people that are in active addiction, um, going through a lot of really terrible things. Um, and what I do is I take the results of these surveys and go to stakeholders. Um, people that are involved in treatment centers in this county. And what they tell me is that they have the hardest time receiving funding from national organizations. Um, for example, there was a study released by NIDA that in 2017 in McDowell County there was zero overdoses. Um, when that, to me, is absolutely false. And we all know it. And in Mercer County they said there was only six. And so what is the AMA doing to make sure that there is legitimacy in the research that goes into who is receiving this funding and what we can do to make sure that rural areas that are not represented at the national level as much uh, gets funding that can help so many of the people that need it. So I want to say something about the data, and you made a good point. We cannot solve a problem if we can't identify the problem, and we have to have accurate data. And I will tell you, you know, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, are responsible for gathering that data. Um, but the states have to have that infrastructure, too, and the public health departments um, that uh, people participate in those surveys, and then that data gets up to the CDC. Uh, so we need to make sure um, that that data is accurate. I certainly agree with that, and I will take what you just said. I'm in Atlanta, CDC is in Atlanta, the CDC is for the, the world, uh, but I will share with them your concern about the accuracy of the data, and I'm not sure where your data came from. If it didn't come from the CDC, the first thing I would say, and I said this earlier, is make sure you are consulting a reputable data source. And of course the CDC and of course state and local public health departments are reputable data sources. And so I would say that too when, whenever you see a statistic and I told the students always ask questions. If a, if a statistic, statistic doesn't make sense, ask where did this come from? You know, who put this statistic out? Is this a reputable organization? And then find the reputable organization to get that statistic. You made another point about funding. And unfortunately, funding for both mental illness and substance use disorders have been woefully inadequate for decades. And we will have a lot of catching up to do. Now, we've had about a bill, we've had, I think in a couple of uh, legislative sessions ago, there was several hundred millions of dollars appropriated by Congress. And of course, that comes down through various ways. Uh, states, uh, block grants, and so forth and so on. And so it's important, and NIDA and SAMHSA, uh, funding could come from either of those issue, uh, either of those agencies, and more. Um, but I talked earlier about the need, and those are usually grants, and those are usually time limited. And so what we at the AMA always advocate for is a sustainable funding infrastructure, grants end and we need sustainable funding, and of course that could occur at the federal level, but also the state level that's going to be sustainable for the long term. Because only West Virginia knows how best, you know, we, we can come up with policy at the AMA, and we do, and we can come up with laws, but local communities know best how to address any health issues, not just the, the opioid uh, epidemic. And that's where it gets to about the accountability of the funding. Um, once the funding comes down, and different states do it different ways, but it's important, again, ask questions. How much money did Georgia get? How much money did West Virginia get? What are we doing with the money? Just be en engaged. It's not hostile. It's not adversarial. It's just, hey, we want to know, um, because I'm 
you're on the front lines and, and delivering that care. That's sustainable funding, and so the AMA, um, we advocate for, and you can see it as, as on our state roadmap, we certainly advocate for sustainable uh, sources of funding to address this issue. Now, that's the other one of the many reasons, as I said earlier, to make sure everyone has access to high quality, affordable coverage. Uh, because if you have access to coverage and your payer is following the parity laws, then you have better access to treatment. Um, so all of those issues, insurance, grants from SAMHSA, NIDA, uh, NIH, or source, and the state, the state, states have put in funding for this, or sources of funding, we just need to make sure, it's not enough. Everything that has been allocated just thus far is not enough, and the AMA continues to advocate for more funding. Other questions? Doesn't have to be necessarily if it, anything on the screen if there's an area you want to ask a question in. Yes. How much money does the AMA spend for lobbyists in Congress to get funding? Is that, and what, what percentage of that, is, of that expense is not going to where it needs to be for the, the ultimate use? I don't have the answer to the, the, the question was for those of you who didn't hear it, how much does the AMA spend on lobbying? And uh, the AMA is a 501c6 organization, so we follow all the nonprofit rules about the percentage of our budget that goes to lobbying. And as you heard from when I started out, advocacy is important. Uh, the a and and it's, a, it's a partnership because the AMA advocates in Congress, but we also need, and I told the students earlier today, everyone in this room, and this is my personal opinion, based on my own experience in leading with authenticity and what I learned during my years of advocacy at the state capitol in Georgia, everyone in this room, again, this is my personal uh, recommendation, should know who your legislators are. Because if the AMA is, is advocating and lobbying for increased funding, I need to know that the people in West Virginia, because we lobby for increased funding on a national level, it's great if we have a partnership that your, your elected officials from West Virginia know that you also want uh, more funding uh, for whatever you want. I'm not telling you what to advocate for. You can choose. We're, talk, we're talking about the opioids. And that's how that partnership works. So we do, we have a DC office. Our headquarters are in Chicago. We have a DC office because as you heard me say at the very beginning, so many decisions that affect physicians, affect healthcare and our ability to healthcare are made in state legislatures and at the congressional level. And we have to be there to give the information we give the, the data. We say two in 10, that slide. We, we tell two in 10 people um, have access to treatment. So this means, that's, that's a data point. This means we need more funding. Um, we don't have enough, uh, students asked me earlier about the physician shortage. We don't have enough graduate medication residency slots. So we have that data, and we advocate for more funding for that. So, I, and I just myriad issues that we advocate on vaping. I mean, myri uh, vaccinations. We advocate on so uh, many issues because advocacy is important all throughout uh, the system. Other questions, comments? Yes. I want to thank you for being the source of inspiration. I'm an international student here at Compol. I actually interested in going to public health, and I want to ask you, like, what are the challenges you came across on how you overcome them before being the president? Involved. So you know, I um, I wanted to be. A physician since I was, uh, you know, in the eighth grade, but it wasn't always a smooth path for me. And I don't have to tell you all the story, but there was detours. I, as you heard, Marcus Welby was my inspiration, but Marcus Welby couldn't tell me how to get to medical school, right? And so I didn't know what to major in, and I didn't um, got to WVU, and I and I picked the wrong thing, and then I got a little discouraged. And someone said, well, "Why don't you 
go to nursing school, and then, so a long story short, I had a lot of detours and challenges. Um, and so what I learned, though, is that um, I um, still, despite detours and challenges, uh, could realize something that I had always dreamed of. I had to find supporters, sponsors, mentors, a, a colleague of mine calls it my own posse, to help me navigate uh, through uh, the maze. Getting into medical school is, is not very hard. Public health, congratulations on your interest in public health. It's critically important that we look at issues um, that affect our populations, the populations as a whole. Now you can get in public health in so many ways. There are masters in public health, and um, I would encourage anyone who's interested in, in um, going into public health to please uh, do so. The other issue is be open to opportunities. I mean, I uh, decided to take that position as um, in, in public health. Um, even though that wasn't what I was trying to do. But here's, if you are a leader and you're a smart leader and someone asks you to do something and you don't think you have all the content knowledge or the expertise, hire somebody that does. Get somebody on your team. None of us can know everything about everything, but smart leaders know what they don't know, right? And they make sure that they build a team um, that uh, addresses any personal knowledge gaps uh, that they have. Leaders are captains of teams, and that's good. Um, and they, uh, again, but don't have to know everything. Uh, just be good listeners. Uh, be willing to um, problem solve. Be willing to admit uh, when you're wrong. Uh, and as I said earlier, learn along the way. So I, I wish you luck in your career, but public health is, is such a critical um, uh, discipline for us in healthcare because it really looks at making the population um, healthy, and physicians certainly want to be good partners in that. Yes, he's coming. And this will be, unfortunately, the last question. I know you mentioned like early childhood development. So, what are you do, or what is the AMA doing to help with um, early childhood <coughs> development, so specifically like foster children who have high rates of like um, mental health issues? So, I want to you know get back to what AMA does, and AMA is has a platform, and we set policy. And that one slide uh, that I showed that talked about all the policy, all the policy that we've passed regarding early childhood development. And so we use our platform at the AMA to elevate, um, to elevate issues um, that impact this country. And so uh, we are very committed uh, to looking at the whole issue of early childhood development, trauma, the impact of these ACEs. And so on this screen are just a few of the policies that were just a few of the policies that we've passed at the AMA. And so you may ask, well then then what? Once the AMA develops policy, well then and, and colleague over here talked about advocacy, then you take that policy. So you can go on our policy. You may say, what does the AMA think about any number of topics related to health care? And go on our website and find that policy. And often folks at the state level use our policy. Um, they say, you know what, the AMA has looked into this issue and they think this is great policy, and then you can use that um, as you advocate either individually or uh, collectively as an organization, any organization, uh, with your legislators. And then as I said, what I want to do this year and am doing and have this platform uh, to do again, because the three strategic priorities um, that I talked about at the beginning are the AMA's three large bucket priorities. But each president at the AMA doesn't come in, though, and change strategic priorities. Uh, I, anyone, any organization that changes strategic priorities every year will not be a very good, strong organization. You have to have a set of priorities and work on those priorities and be commit, committed to those priorities. But those are three big buckets. But each president 
comes to the AMA for one year, we're, we, our presidential term is one year, and we bring our own unique lens and vision, which is as a child psychiatrist, that's why I'm elevating the need for mental health care, and AMA has a lot of policy on that, integrated into overall health care, making sure we have a diverse workforce uh, where the physicians of our, uh, the faces of our physicians match the faces of our patients. Make sure we're looking at health equity and the social determinants of health and that whole issue around childhood trauma. And then personally, of course, I do a lot of work in Georgia, um, working with various organizations. Um, and I see, the, the patients that I see in my practice are mostly in the foster care system. So we are at time. I thank you so much for being a wonderful audience and giving me the opportunity to come home uh, to Southern West Virginia, and I wish you best in all of your endeavors. I just want to say thank you for uh, Dr. P uh, Patrice Harris being here. This was a wonderful, inspiring um, speech, and we hope you have the very best in your work at the AMA. I believe it's in really good hands. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>